so Joe told me I should do a brief introduction of myself, and I was wondering what do I introduce. Um, so, but but let me just give you a small background where I come from. Uh, I, I I'm born and brought up in Pune, born into a Syrian Christian family, uh, very God fearing, caring, loving family. Uh, our childhood was uh, fantastic, but great economic challenge. Suffice to say, um, childhood was all about a struggle to make three square meals, and I mean literally. Uh, dresses, me and my brother were all hands down uh, from our richer cousins. Uh, fees for school had to be paid by our uh, <clears throat> relatives. So that's an idea of the struggle we went through. Uh, uh, and today uh, we are doing reasonably well. Uh, a brief one line about my brother, where he's, 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 he's part of a company called Baskin Robbins, Duncan Robbins, uh, if you folks know. Uh, so he's head of uh, the world operations for that company, uh, non-US operations for Baskin and Duncan. Um, so when we look back, we say from that background where we came from, what is the one thing which differentiates and why uh, we both could do reasonably well? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there, there could be many answers, uh, but as I have said on many forums before, and I will keep saying, I think that there will be multiple factors. To me, there's only one factor. It is my mother's prayers. Uh, and there is no doubt about it. Uh, both of us uh, are very strong practicing Christians, and every forum we get a chance to say uh, how one person's prayers can take people places, uh, and I'm a living example of that. Uh, recently, my brother, uh, he reports into a US CEO, uh, he asked him, how come you're doing so well? Who's your inspiration? And he told him, it's my brother. He said, what about your brother? Who is he? What does he do? So he says, I learned one thing from my brother, which is work is fun. Uh, so he said, I mean, that's a very funny learning to have. Uh, and so my brother had once, uh, when he started his career, he was working for a company called Gum Products. I don't know if you know this company. He lost his job, and he didn't tell our parents that he had lost his job, so he used to hang around with me in my company. And uh, so I said, work with me for a couple of months and see what work is. Uh, before you decide what you want to do with your career. So he worked with me for two months, and post that, he got into a realization that work is fun. And today he says what he is in his career is because of that philosophy that he's had, that work is not a pain, but work is fun. So when Joe called me and asked me whether I would like to speak on this topic, or whether I could speak on the topic, I said, wow, this is a topic which is very close to my heart. Um, so, 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 so it honestly didn't take too much of preparation, uh, because this is a topic which... Uh, uh, in, in management forums, uh, training programs within the offices that I work for, I do, I speak in other forums, and this is a topic I always keep speaking upon. Uh, so this is very close to my heart, and so honestly, I believe, uh, and we'll come to that. So let me take a deep dive into the topic. Yeah. So the topic is not no pain, no gain, but I want to do one slide for just to just refresh our memories on uh, what do we mean by no pain, no gain. All of us know this at some level. Uh, that you can't get results, you can't get what you want unless you put in a solid effort. You know, and, and physical attribution of physical work is Muhammad Ali, uh, yeah, Mike Tyson, sorry. What did I press? Yep. So this is, this is a kind of routine that this gentleman keeps. 2,000 squats, 500 triceps, and so on and so forth. But the key operative word here is Trained twice than his peers. What is being said here is he was better than his peers because he trained twice more. So there's a direct correlation between the effort that he was putting and the results that he was getting. Uh, we are all aware of this. I don't know, uh, a lot of youngsters here, so a lot of people working at the gym uh, uh, and things like that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, all of us wish we are. Some of us wish we are in the gym. Some of us are in the gym. And it's a fact, you know, I don't know how many of you know, there's a science behind building muscles. And the science is, unless your muscle fibers tear, uh, your muscle doesn't get built. Because the process of building the muscles when the fibers tear, when the muscles are built back, is when the muscles get built. So unless there is pain, there is no gain as far as the physical part of the life is concerned. So I think everybody knows this. I just wanted to take this one slide before I dive into the topic, which is no pain is in vain. Now, if all of us know that uh, there is no gain without pain, then why aren't we all pursuing pain? And we all want gain, right? We all have our goals, and we all have those dreams, and we have those aspirations, and which we say, how do we get it? But it's pretty obvious to all of us, 
if not on the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, that without pain there is no gain. So we should all be in the pursuit of pain. Right? If pursuit of happiness, you see it, if pursuit of gain has to be pursuit of pain, but what do we on the contrary do? We rationalize. We give excuses. Uh, we postpone pain continuously. We are in the continuous process of postponing pain. The youngster sitting here, so how many times have you said exams was three months away? I'll start studying next month. There's a lot of time, I know. Um, I've got two kids, you know, so, so my examples are very real. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'll attend lectures from next week. I mean, this is, this is New Year's time. My friends have come from abroad and you know, we got to spend time with them. And we got enough reasons and rationals to say, why well, I'll do everything from next week. So we keep postponing it. Okay, then workplace, there is this invariable theory. This is a boring assignment. I know I have to work seriously, but I'll do the next assignment seriously. This one, it's okay, but this one. But this one, my boss, you know, he didn't speak to me straight. He was rude to me, so why should I do my best for this one? So we are all forever rationalizing. Uh, we are forever finding reasons why we want to postpone pain, although it's counterintuitive. We just discussed 30 seconds back that there is no pain without gain, and we all know it. But in spite of that, at some level, we are all postponing. So the way our brain functions is we are trying to avoid the pain. We are trying to seek pleasure. We want instant gratification. Yeah, so this is the problem that we are all struggling with. So what we are actually trying to do is, you know, all of us believe that we are, we are the smart guy, you know. I will somehow study in this last 15 days. I know I'm very committed. I know I'm my goal. But I will cram in the last 15 days. I'll sacrifice sleep and I will make up. So we are hoping that we will beat the law. So there's something called the law of the farm. So unless the law of the farm is unless you plow the field at a particular point of time, unless you do the entire process, the fruit won't come. But we want to beat the system. We all think that the last 10 days, actually somewhere on the subconscious mind we're hoping. We are hoping that I can break the system and without putting in sufficient effort, I will get the gain. But I'm hoping that the gain will come to me. And uh, I don't know how many of you have read an author called uh, Scott Peck, uh, one of my most favorite authors. And he starts his book, this is the first line in his book, The Roadless Travel, the first line in his book. And he says, life is difficult. This is a great truth and one of the greatest truths. It is a great truth, but once we truly see this truth, then we transcend it. So the fact is, let none of us kid ourselves. Let none of us sit and say, I will find the shortcut. I, will I, know, I am that lucky guy. And things will turn out right for me. Life is difficult. And it's important that we realize that and not hope that you know, I will be the lucky guy. There is, no, there is no luck factor here. Life is difficult. So how do we transcend this difficulty in life. So there are three points I want to uh, put up before we move on to the next thing. And point number one is, if we want to transcend uh, the fact that li life is difficult, we should know the art of delayed gratification. Yeah. So we all know what procrastination is, what we just discussed. You know, we've decided that we're going to start studying this weekend. But this weekend, three friends arrived. So uh, so that's more important. A good movie got released, unfortunately, this Friday when I was supposed to start, and I didn't get ticket on a Friday, so on a Saturday. So uh, this is 31st December, Jan, this is the party time. So we find enough reason to procrastinate and postpone the unpleasant task. So for a minute, concentrate on the sentence. What is delayed gratification? Delayed gratification is a process of scheduling the pain and pleasures of life in such a way as to enhance the pleasure by meeting and experiencing the pain first and getting it over with. It is, only the most, it is the only decent way to live. So what it means is, if, if this week on a Sunday I'm planning for the next week and I want X things to do in terms of what I think I should do and the other things which is the pleasure things, what I want to do with my friends and things like that, can I schedule my things which I think is important to me in such a way that I do that first before I do the pleasure. It's all about scheduling. Can I put what is important to me first before I take my pleasure? That's called delayed gratification. 
So you're delaying the gratification, you're delaying the, the pleasure. Okay, I don't know how many of you know of this test called the marshmallow test. This was conducted at Stanford University in the 1970s. So this is very eminent psychoanalyst did this study. So there was this nursery inside Stanford University called the Bing Nursery, which was for the students of Stanford University, or for the staff of Stanford University, the kids were sitting in that nursery. So what they did is they identified about 16 kids, put them into a classroom, and I'll tell you the summary. They gave them marshmallows or other kind of Oreos and other biscuits and things like that, and told them, here is this one biscuit for you. We're going to come back after 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, if you've not eaten this one marshmallow, we'll give you another one. But if you eat any time in between, then we will come in immediately. So all that the kids had to do was wait for 15 minutes before they gave it to the gratification of eating that marshmallow. So less than one third of the students, or the nursery kids, huh? so they're not just simple nursery kids. Less than one third could wait for 15 minutes. Some waited for five, some waited for 10, and so on and so forth. So that's not the interesting part of the study. So in 19, this was in 1970, in 1988, they tracked progress of these kids. And lo and behold, the kids who could delay gratification were doing far, far superior to the kids who couldn't delay gratification. So they said, the study was still not conclusive. So they said most of those kids were at the age where they would give the SAT scores. So they waited for another two years when most of them would complete the SAT scores by then. So 1990, they did a study again, and they found a clear correlation between the SAT scores and your ability to delay gratification. So, and, and this is over a 20 year, 1970, uh, 1988, 1990. So have no doubt what delayed gratification can do. Proverbs 24, Sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. I find this verse extremely funny. Yeah, you don't plow in season, then why do you expect? Yeah, so harvest time they will go look and they won't find nothing. But to me it's counterintuitive, you know, why would you expect if I have not studied for the exam, if I am not done every, uh, if I'm not the best at my job, why do I expect something good at the appraisal time? Why do I expect good marks? But we are all hoping. That's how we are wired. We are saying, yeah, that I didn't do my best is only known to me, but the result, the result should not reflect my input. Yeah? So we are all permanently in this. So we do not plow in season, but harvest time we look and we find nothing. But we, our appetite is not short. Our expectations are not small. Yeah? We still want to be promoted. Why was that guy promoted? Yeah? Or why did I not get the 95 marks percent to whatever I was looking for? And we will look external to us, but the fact is, uh, we were a sluggard. We didn't do what we were supposed to do. And if you don't do what we are supposed to do, why would we get what we want? But the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. So, so an important point about delayed gratification. So, oh, it's so... It, it's got such magical powers, delayed gratification, but it must be difficult. So delayed gratification is not denying gratification. So it's not giving up spending time with friends. It's not giving up the things that you love to do. It's rescheduling them. So it's not as difficult. Yeah? So don't confuse between delayed gratification and denying gratification. This is only about scheduling. Okay, the second point, I'll, I got three, four slides and I'll run through this. So many a times we don't put in our effort, we don't do very hard saying that, you know, that guy next to me, he's highly talented. You know, he's blessed, God has blessed him with so much talent that I just can't cope. You know, the other students have got such more facilities or so, so many other things. So what is the point in I putting the effort? Or my colleague has such, such better communication skills, such better personality, that he's bound to do better than me. So what is the point in I putting the effort? So we invariably think that talent is what takes some people ahead. And some people have got inborn talent and don't have. So why do I put the effort? I don't know how many of you know of Wilma Rudolph. So this picture on the left is Wilma Rudolph when she was young. Polio. Yeah? 
she ends up winning three gold medals in sprint in the Rome Olympics. Talent or practice? Yeah, so these examples are taken from a book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know how many of you have read this, but it's a brilliant book. Uh, so these are some examples from that book. So all of us know Beatles, and we all know Beatles as very successful. So most of us think Beatles is a group from the US, but they're not from the US, they're from the UK. So they started playing together in 1957. They came to the US in 1964. In the interim, they couldn't make two ends meet because they were struggling. So from, they were, from, I think, from Liverpool, if I'm not mistaken. In the, there may be Beatles fans here. So where Liverpool? Yeah. So they, so to make two ends meet, they would go to Hamburg, and they would perform at Hamburg in these uh, shacks and in these restaurants, and they would perform for five hours, six hours every day, day in and day out, for survival, because to make two ends meet. But later on, by the time they reached the U.S., they had already performed 1,200 times. So when they started performing in the US, they could perform so well because of the number of hours they had put in before. So it, the, the rule says that if you practice for 10,000 hours, then you become a master. So Beatles had to be Beatles because of the 10,000 hours they put in. So it was the practice which made Beatles Beatles. Not only the creativity and the jazz that we see, there was a lot of hard work behind that. Very interesting case study. <laughs> this is the Berlin Academy of Music, which is supposed to be the ultimate academy of music. So they, uh, they had these violin uh, students with them. So they were with them. They were, uh, there was this batch which was being studying for a long time. So at a point of time, they said, now it's high time that we differentiate and say, who is capable of what? So the experts analyzed all the students and said they were divided them into three groups. So group one was what they said are, the ultimate experts. They said, these people can become class soloists. The second group they said, very talented, but they can't become soloists, but they can become good professionals. The third group they said, very good, but neither can they be soloists or professionals, but they can become teachers in schools. They can teach students how to play the violin. So after classifying these people into three groups, they went about saying, why, what is the difference between the three groups? And they analyze huge number of parameters, talent, genetic factors, are the parents have a love for music. They analyzed all kind of factors and came to the conclusion that there's only one factor. <clears throat> the first group, the soloists, they had practiced six hours a day by age nine, eight hours a week by age 12, and so on and so forth. They had completed 10,000 hours of practice. So what was common for group two? They had spent 8,000 hours of practice. What was common for group three? Four. So what was the straight correlation? It was not talent. It was not the quality of teachers. It was straight correlation is with the effort that they were putting in. And we're talking music. We're talking of a creative science here. We're talking of an, not science, we're talking of an art of music here. Correlation between hard work and talent. So it's not talent, it's hard work. Third point, okay. Another example, quickly I'll run through this, Bill Gates. We all think of Bill Gates and say, whenever we don't have to study, we say, if Bill Gates without going to college can become Bill Gates, then all of us can be Bill Gates. So the, so the secret of becoming Bill Gates is don't study. Be a college dropout. Um, but a but, but very interesting thing about Bill Gates, which Malcolm Gladwell researched and found out, that for various factors, he had actually spent 10,000 hours on a computer before he became the Bill Gates that we know. His school, coincidentally, computers were becoming only popular then. The mothers had put up a computer, so he had a lot of hours of practice. There was, an, there was a CCC, he used to practice there. CCC closed. There was an institute called the ISI, where you could practice as long as you did programming free. So they would practice and do the programming free. Uh, in a seven month period in 1971, they had run 1,575 hours of computer time, which is eight hours a day, seven days a week. So that's the kind of hours that Bill Gates put for him to become the expert who suddenly discovered Windows. A lot of hard work has gone behind that. We're talking about creative people here. Okay. <laughs> so I, I hope uh, these three examples was to prove the fact that uh, 
if at all at any point we're not putting the effort thinking that I don't have the talent it's not talent which differentiates it's the amount of effort the grind which does the differentiation a third point before we move see whenever we are in a tough situation all of us believe we are the victim you know we believe life has been so I mean I could have done my best if my parents could send me to the best school because my parents have not sent me to the best school I can't be as good as everybody else I wish I had the best tuition I could go to and we find various reasons so whenever we can't get what we want rather than looking at the effort that we've put we end up trying to play the victim we rationalize and we paint ourselves into a corner and fill with all kind of sob stories so what so what we should do is when we are in tough times we should see what can we learn from the tough times so are you a student or a victim so student does not care what happened he says what is God teaching me through this tough situation so rather than wallowing in self-pity he tries to learn what he could learn victim says life is not fair student says what happened to me could have happened to anybody victim feels sorry for himself and has no time for others the student focus on helping others just one example to get the student versus victim through countless appraisals I have gone through in my professional career and invariably after every appraisal there's somebody who thinks that things have not been fair to that person and and it's a very legitimate part of any process you can never be 100% fair to everybody so there are three kinds of people there is one kind who will say completely unfair company has been unfair to me and will start sulking and start sulking and not putting the best effort saying the company is not fair to me and it gets into a sulk mode there's a second kind which says this company is a bunch of jerks nobody is fair to me they're biased they'll quit the company and go find another job which may not be the most optimum job but in the necessity and desperation to get out they'll go from fire into the frying pan and the third category which says hey I am better than what these guys think I am so I'm going to put more effort I'm going to do more extra to change their perception about me because I know I'm good the third guy is a student of the situation he's not playing a victim he is not into sulk and he's not running away from battle he says if the situation is such that people don't know how good I am I have to understand why people don't think how good I am so let me see what best I can do out of that rather than sulking or running away so that's what is playing the student and not the victim okay so if we do all this the point I'm trying to convey is if we can do all this no longer we find we'll realize that unless we really put the effort we can't get what we want to get but again it's not as simple yeah some verses to on this it's a very interesting verse consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete so if you don't go through tough times you will not be mature so you have to go through tough times and you have to be perseverant to become mature so when you go through tough times rather than playing the victim try to see what you can learn from it and become more mature this was still more interesting because it says suffering produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope so if we want maturity if you want character to develop when we are in tough situations rather than sulking and withdrawing and justifying and rationalizing we should see what we can learn from that but more importantly and I've uh, consciously changed the topic from uh, what Nathan and uh, Joe gave me to say is pain really pain uh, I am personally of the opinion pain is not really pain like my I, like a quoted from brother innumerable incidents I have gone through in my past where we go through a tough time but end of that tough time you say wow that was really worth it so when does pain stop becoming pain and I've got three points for saying when does point stop becoming pain uh, as the last three slides or three focus points before I move on. first is do we have a goal all successful people have this one thing in common that they have goals how many of us have written goals okay I don't know um, there's a very famous author called Anthony Robbins in his book he talks of an experiment conducted in Yale University in 1953 um, so 1953 the Yale University batch they interviewed the batch and said how many of you people have goals 
So I believe of the batch, 13% or 16% of the people had goals. The rest didn't have goals. Then they asked, how many of you have written goals? And 3% of that 16% had written goals, which they could pull out of their wallet. So written goal had to be carried with you. So 3% of the people had written goals. 20 years later, they analyzed, or 25 years later, I'm not sure the exact period, they analyzed how good these Yale University graduates were doing, and they found the collective wealth of the 3% was more than the collective wealth of the 97%. Sounds preposterous, right? That's the power of a goal. Because goal gives you direction. Goal channelizes your energy. Goal tells you that this is what I want to achieve. So then every day, every step that you take is working towards your goal. So the moment you have a goal, which is important to you, not to your colleagues, not because of peer pressure, not to your boss, not to your spouse, not to your parents, but a goal which is important to you, it unleashes tremendous amount of energy. Yeah, human potential has no limits. Corinthians 9.24 Do you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives a prize, so run that you may obtain it. We are running through this race of life with no goal. Most of us are running through this race of life with no clear goal. Why am I running? So I'm supposed to be running with everybody, I'm also running. Why am I running because the next guy is running? But what do I want out of that race? Maybe I want to be first. Maybe I want my physical endurance to go. But unless I have a clear objective why I'm in that race, why am I running in the race? But most of us, if you stop back and think, we are going through this race of life not knowing what do I expect out of this race. Without a clear-cut goal, we are running through this race of life. If you, okay, assuming you have a goal, uh, assuming we are part of that 13% uh, or, or the 16 or the three, or 13 and the 3, uh, and if not, we will become part of the 13 and the 3, uh, what, what, what is the next step? The next step is to have a plan. So we can have a goal, but if you don't have a plan, then we will keep floundering. We will keep going to and fro. So a plan brings in efficiency, brings in focus. So there's a brilliant quote from Stephen Covey which says that all things are created twice. First, mentally in our mind. That's the plan. Before the physical execution really happens. So if the creation does not happen twice, first in the mind and then actually, then you can be sure the creation will happen a number of times because we'll keep attempting, failing, keep attempting, failing. So it's important that we first have a clear-cut plan of what we want to achieve. Again, a clear-cut written plan of how do we want to achieve our goal. Superb verse, which sums up everything that I want to say about the plan. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this is the person began to build and wasn't able to finish it. That's what we do with many of the goals we have. So first and foremost, the goals may not be written. They may be vague. Then we don't have a specific plan, so we go ahead, then we come back with two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. So we're not clear where we are going. So how could we proceed without a plan? So once you have a goal, you obviously require a plan. And the third part is assuming you've got a goal and assuming you've got a plan is the self-discipline or self-control to ensure that you stick to your plan. Yeah? So, any, so anybody who says he has a goal is succeeded has never happened true. This is the most important thing. Because we don't have self-discipline is why we get into procrastination. We have good intentions of what we want to do, but we can't execute because we, by the time we are there, we have got other diversions, we are led by our impulses and our feelings rather than taking a rational call. So in 2013, there was a study conducted in Germany and they clearly said those people with self-discipline are more capable of dealing with goal conflicts. They are not dictated by impulses or feelings, but they take rational decisions without getting stressed. So the key to, assuming we have a goal and a plan, the key is self-discipline. Our ability to do what we want to do. But is this so simple? If this was simple, then all of us would have been achieving our goals. So the key to achieving our goals is 
The tough part is self-discipline or self-control. So we did fruits of the spirit, right? And self-control is one of the fruits of the spirit. So how do we get control over or how do we build self-control? Okay. Discipline, Hebrews 12, 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained. So the Bible says the importance of discipline. The important part, you got the last slide, can you put the offside? So how do we get self-control? I think Romans 9, 17 to 18. I've got it here. Yeah, I'll just read this verse before, and this is my last slide. Romans 7, 18 to 20. Yeah, just listen carefully to this one. For I know that good itself does not dwell with me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I'll repeat the line. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. So I, do not, I can't do the good that I want to do. I actually end up doing the evil that I do not want to do. And this I keep on doing. I, I, I don't learn from my mistakes. I keep on doing the same thing. What do I do? Not do what I want to do. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer, who, no longer I who do it. And who is doing it? But it is the sin living in me that does it. So why can't we have self-control? Is because of sin living within us. Because we yield to the pleasures of the flesh. And the spirit is not within us. When we yield to the pleasures of the, of the flesh, uh, then invariably uh, we can't do what we want to do. But when we repent and come to God, He is faithful and forgives us. But that's the message of the cross, right? If we go to God and surrender, repent and surrender, and say, not my will be done, but your will be done, our sins are forgiven and we are filled with the Spirit, and then the fruits of the Spirit becomes available to us. So unless we are filled with the Spirit, unless we repent, forgive and surrender, uh, the fruit of the Spirit will not be with us and we will keep on trying. And whatever we keep on trying, we will not do what we want to do, but we will do what we do not want to do because of our sinful nature, because of the flesh, because we are yielding to the pleasures of the flesh. So if we want to develop self-control, it's important that we repent and surrender and ask God's forgiveness and let the Holy Spirit dwell within us. So the fruits of the Spirit is available to us. To summarize the gist of what I am trying to say here, or what I've been attempting to say is, if our goals, if our plans are centered around God, if it's not our pleasures, if it's not we driving our goals and the plans, if it's centered around God, and if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and self-control is available with us, assuming we repent and surrender, there is no goal that we cannot achieve. The only thing we can keep on doing is underestimate the potential which God has gifted us. We can do far more than what each one of us hope to think, hope and things and dreams what we can do. The potential God has gifted us is far, far high. But it's important to unleash that potential. I surrender my personal interests, my personal goals and surrender to God. Understands God's plan for me. Make a goal, goal which is aligned to God's objective. Make a plan which is aligned to Him and surrender before Him and take His Holy Spirit which will help us to have the self-control to achieve the goals and plans that we have. Thank you.